I'm so tired. There's so much work to be done. And I've got a jazz concert tonight. I need these papers on my desk ASAP. What's Zoom Boom? Just one teaspoon dissolved in water is all you need to keep you going through the night. A one, a two, a one, two, three. Zoom Boom, it helps me get through the night. Zoom Boom! Zoom Boom! Zoom Boom! It gives me the energy I need now so I can sleep like a baby later! <laughs> <laughs> Honey, I need to talk to you about something. It's very important. I'm all ears. I found something in Diana Timmy's bed. Well, what did you find? I found a pack of cigarettes today. Laramie's cigarettes. I heard you were smoking. Huh? Smoking is bad for you. If you smoke the wrong brand. You should try Saigon cigarettes. I started smoking them at now. Real men smoke Saigon cigarettes. My husband smokes five packs a day. That's why my son's a real man now. He smokes Saigon cigarettes. I asked my doctor why my hair was turning green when I left the pool. He told me I had nasty chemicals penetrating the roots of my hair. But Bottle Blonde gets rid of those nasty chemicals. Sometimes I wish I was blonde so I could use Bottle Blonde. I'm a Bottle Blonde girl. When I first started working out, I could barely lift any weights compared to the other guys. What is that? What is It's a medicine ball. Can I try? I could barely even do two pull-ups. And I was embarrassed to work out around other people. Here, try this. What's that? Juggling. Bulk like a bull. Mmm. Then I took juggling, and it changed my life. I was no longer tormented by the other guys. <laughs> Jebelin changed my life. It can change yours, too. No matter... Nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. 
How then am I mad? Hark, and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but, once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. This is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution. With what foresight. With what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it oh so gently. You would have laughed to have seen how cunningly I thrust in my head. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as to this? And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so, it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, in a hearty tone, and inquiring to how he had passed the night. How was your night? So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked upon him while he slept. 
Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, my own sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing on it steadily and steadily. I kept quiet still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still listening, just as I had done night after night. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him, and he had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not, because death and approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. I saw it with perfect distinctness. All a dull blue with hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. I scarcely breathed. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder. I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now with the dead hour of night amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized upon me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon his heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me. No more.
you still think me mad. You will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took in the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but with silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the skittles. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. I had made an end of these labors. It was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves, with perfect suavity, as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been logged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled 
for what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, had been my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. This is the old man's study, just as he left it. I then led them to the parlor. while I, myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. But, ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct, until at length I found the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. Villains! Dissemble no more! I admit the deed! Tear up the planks! Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart!
Oh, yeah. The way- 